Sam. <clears throat> um, Rachel, I, since we tested the Rachel, we haven't tested the Laura's presentation yet. Uh, Rachel, can we go with your presentation? Yes. Okay, hi. Okay, let me do my two second introduction. Um, Rachel, who joins us from New York, is a multimedia artist and software programmer working primarily in virtual reality and painting. Um, things to say, uh, she's very young, but I would have to say a lot of things. There's a lot of, she's done a lot of interesting things. In 2015, she was the first virtual reality fellow at the New Museums Incubator New, uh, New Inc. Uh, in 2021, she exhibited oil paintings embedded with the holograms in a gallery in New York. Uh, she logged her, her genome on a blockchain as a smart contract minted on a, an NFT platform. Now, this uh, I'm glad you called your your, um, your talk the vocabulary of uh, new art because you know words like blockchain, smart contract, NFT. Uh, were very obscure until recently. And now, of course, you can find uh, news every day <clears throat> using this, uh, this uh, concept. She's currently working on a commission for a museum in Berlin and uh, the Whitney Museum of Art in New York City. Okay, all yours. Okay, thank you. Okay. You can you can see my screen. Yes. 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 No problem. Yes. Okay. Great. Um. So, like Pierre said, thank you for having me. Um. I I wanted to take the opportunity of this talk to 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 talk about um like from the lens of a traditional artist uh, presentation uh, to. Yeah, address emergent vocabulary, um, like yeah, through the lens of my own work and and the like an aspect to the phenomenological experience of technology. Um, and my background is unusually technical for a visual artist, um, and so I thought that that would, this would be a good place to start. Um, I I began programming when I was eight and um, my first drawings were made on a dot matrix printer with ASCII. And uh, yeah, so I thought, yeah. So I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna try and stay. Okay, so first I'd like to prime the conversation with this project that Pierre just mentioned, uh, where I minted my genome on the, um, as an NFT and it was actually in, a direct inspiration from uh, Sam's work. I mean, it's exactly what it, I wanted to point to. Um, and then there was this this, this uh, project that I was fascinated with um, uh, where they took living cells of a leech, um, Georgia Tech took living cells of a leech and made a calculator. And I was thinking about um, what technology is going to look for and how it feels in a way like we're so our vocabulary around these spaces is still so um undeveloped and part of the artist's role is to is to find language for that right and to find vocabulary for that um and i think an aspect to yeah it's like i like i i wanted to get away from the fetish, fetishization of technology um and the the sort of like leaning into the novelty of it and and more think about in an aspect of like the way that like a clawed glass was used um, by Renaissance painters, um, which is like a black mirror. And it's just to see sort of tonal progression uh, in a landscape. Um, and so I'm gonna go first to a project, uh, a show that I did titled Lossy um, to talk about this in aspect. And Lossy is titled after an algorithm, um, the, a, loss, a lossy algorithm. Um, it's a shorthand for entropy, and it just optimizes data um, by destroying part of it uh, every generational, um, like every state change or generational change. And the I wanted to place these 
virtual reality, the virtual reality installation next to uh, these paintings um, to, to find a way to track this conversation that's happening where there's a phenomenological state change or exchange um, between these two spaces. Um, and so the way that the piece works is it's it appears to be photogrammetry tableaus. Um, and the, these tableaus are like somewhat salient um, spaces that I picked like childhood home, like things that felt important to the show. Um, the spaces that didn't exist, I rendered and then put backwards into the photogrammetry algorithm. Um, the work is from like 2015. And, uh, and so there was this like, the, the tools at the time were really crude. Um, but I leaned into that and um, had uh, for the experience of the piece, each viewer was given um, the arbiters of the piece and the piece is living and resets every day. And what I mean by like arbiter of the piece is that their, um, their gaze, the way that they move through the, the space, they take part of the piece with them. Um, so there's a ray cast out from the, the gaze of the viewer that eats away um, at these tableaus. Um, so, and the, I just wanted to, I'm going back to this slide just to talk about like the there's this experience that we take for granted when we move through uh, like these spaces where there's a, a residue um, that's left on us, uh, a phenomenological residue that's left on us, or a state change. And I was I was thinking about it's almost like a cousin of déjà vu, like a, it's a, the patina of déjà vu. And the inspiration for the show came from seeing the Hudson Valley River paintings before I saw the Hudson Valley River. Um, and there was this, this sort, of, sort of like crash zoom effect that happened where I felt recursively or that there was this like um, experience of seeing this work uh, and flattening the, the space that was made from and the image. And jumping forward to these combines that um, I've been making recently where you can see that like recursion or the meta the sort of meta scaffolding that's happening with, with what I'm talking about with like site and the space where the, the paintings are made from or the virtual space where the paintings are made from ends up being collapsed on the surface of the paintings. Uh, so they are like very simply just self-referential um, uh, sort of metabolisms. And um, I think it's interesting, it's like when I think about you know, I've been asked a lot about what's going on with the metaverse and it's this sort of like transmedia um, lens. And I think that this, for me, this is like the, the closest proximity I can sort of like begin to visually describe what that means, which is like a scaffolded, pro sort of like scaffolding or proxies that come out from where you are um, in physical reality to um, an extent out into virtual reality or virtual spaces. Um, and this is an installation view of a solo, my solo show, Boohoo Stamina. Um, so I want to talk about the importance of programming in my work, and I'm just going to show part of this work that is a sort of tongue-in-cheek. I mean, a lot of my work is using um, this is like a tongue in cheek uh, expression of like recursion. Um, and it's using the library of OpenCV and OpenCV is this library that's uh, sort of the front end for all surveillance, for a lot of surveillance and AI applications. Um, and I just wanted to do the self-referential relationship. Wait, can you hear the sound? No, I can't. Okay. Hold no, on. I cannot. Okay, hold on. Yes. Uh, no. Yes. You might have to reshare and click enable. Sound. Yeah, I, I hear some sound. Yes. Okay, hold on.
Mm-hmm. Blue screen. Where are y'all? There you are. Still blue screen. Okay, let's see. If not, we can go without. How's that? Well, Nine. Video is so so. It's a freezing. That's okay. We could. Uh, you can. I'll send links. I'll send links to things. It's really. Hmm. Yeah, it's probably better. Yeah, we... it's good. It's gonna be fun, anyways. The. Uh, so, and yeah, back to, I mean, it's just the, it's a, the piece itself is just talking about using the idea of recursion and these traces, you know, it's like, you know, about these, the, the condensation between these two states, um, and, and thinking about the, the way that these are ex like the exchange process, um, which is one of the motifs in my work. Um, and similarly, it relates to these plexiglass sculptures that are uh, that I call um, hollow body, um, hollow body sculptures, and they're paintings. They're also uh, prints that are embedded in the surface of the plexiglass, and it's my way of pressing. I mean, I want them to to stand on their um, uh, with their own physicality, but the way that I form them is they soften the plexiglass with with a blowtorch, and then. Um, and then and then um, press my body into them so that you can as you're moving through the the space um, where it's installed you can see time sort of held you know you can see like a part of my knee or a part of my hand um, this was a commission uh, by Rhizome and and Hyundai that was an AR piece that was overlaid that was um, just showing kind of exploding the the source material like where the because a lot of the work is like made from world building right like kind of talking about the scaffolding or layers um and so it's extending the the world really simply just out into the um, museum space as the source material and the assets um So this show, this show is titled Stalking the Trace. Um, and this piece is interesting because it's like I, I needed to make a tone poem or a setting for this virtual reality piece. And you can see in the wings here. Um, and it was using the, the residue of the viewer um in a similar way to a lot of the other work um, we're talking about like these state exchanges or like the um yeah the using the viewer in virtual reality as the arbiter of the piece and so the way that the piece functionally works the virtual reality piece um and this is a piece that i first developed uh, during my fellowship at the new museum incubator uh new Inc. but i wanted to extrapolate the idea of uh, the way that you scrub through two-dimensional time in a um, in, like for virtual reality in three-dimensional time, and so I uh, the way that you scrubbed time in this piece was three-dimensional time. This is a just an example. This is a cutscene from Call of Duty. Um, if you could hear the sound, you would hear the the, the sound um, being sped up and uh, reversed based on where the person is. The console view is here, and the headset view is here. Um, and this is just a very short room scale uh, box, but um, yeah. So I and I wanted just that, yeah, sort of the residue, just the 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 viewer 
the disembodied viewer being the arbiter of the piece and and that being stretched to what the game time of the piece was. Um, and so that's what's happening on the sides here. And the same assets or resource material is what's shown as part of this tone poem in the in the piece. And so what you ended up scrubbing through are these pieces that, um, let me see, I'll show you this. Yeah, too bad we can't hear the sound. I know. That's it's okay. Sad. You can you can post the links to the videos in the chat, and yeah, we'll hear it later. Um, and how this worked physically, because I wanted some relationship between the way that the VR piece works and the way that the installation works is I, I wanted th that the feeling of yeah the condensation I'm just going to use that now as like the shorthand for what I'm talking about but the 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 residue of the state exchange right and so the way that the piece is installed is there's these are zoetrope apertures on the side um, and the lighting sequence is synced to the visuals of the installation so that when you're walking physically through the piece, there's, you can see the expectation of somebody that's, um, the way the zoetrope works is that you're seeing. So if you, you imagine like scrubbing physically through the piece or walking physically through the piece, you see the after image, like there's sort of these ghosts that would appear as artifacts in um, real life, you know. Okay, I'm gonna go fast through this now. Um, I really, you know, I really want this to move. I don't know. Okay, so this leads me to Man Mask. Uh, this is a piece where I'm leading an em embodiment meditation. This was commissioned originally by the New Museum in Rhizome. It was just acquired by the Whitney Museum. Um, and it's a piece where I used a uh, markless motion capture just to lead this embodiment med meditation from um, my own experience of growing up gaming. Um, I was just trying to find neutrality because I was heavily into Counter-Strike and other first-person shooter games. And there's a lot of, you know, because my background has, you know, there's so much of my experience doing game development and um, engineering and uh, computer programming. So, so, so much of that comes into the work. Um, but this piece was interesting because it was difficult to make a VR piece. I had never made a VR piece that was just video. And so I wanted to regard the viewer, um, but they had no um, agency or autonomy in the, like they had no say in where and, and how the piece was functioning, which is how all the VR pieces I had made before. Um, because that's one of the most interesting things to me about um, using virtual reality. And so this was a, a an experiment in how to regard the viewer and it was through the, the um, through leading this embodiment meditation, um, which is a lot of how I approach my painting practice. Um, and I can go into that later, but I don't know. I'm gonna move through these because I feel like I'm short on time. This, so the work that I'm producing now as a part of this KW commission in Berlin, um, that's going to be a larger uh, transmedia um, piece, meaning like it's going to work, it's going to be a, a digital piece, it's going to be an AR piece, it's going to be a physical installation. And it's going to move across these, a, a lot of different forms. But at first, uh, the first piece is this, AI, uh, it's this GAN that I built as a filter um, that was based on my own drawing style. Um, and it's this, the, I'll send a link to the, to the piece itself, but it's titled The Ma Of. 
and it's dealing with brand and machine interfaces and um, mostly focusing on the, the Neuralink, um, uh, the, like, you know, just the progress of like where Neuralink is today. And, um, but it's like, there's a retelling of what's, what's happening, what's happening here uh, through this, uh, through this piece. Um, I think I'm going to leave it there. Yes, I'm going to leave it there. Okay, well, that's that's a very good panorama of your uh, of your work. Uh, again, these are just teasers, so so people can go to your website. <clears throat> I also saw some of your paintings on was it artsy.net? Uh, mm -hmm. I don't have it right now. Anyway, there's uh, there's also some interesting paintings. Uh, somehow, somehow they reminded me of uh, Tangui, the surrealist painter, but that could be just me. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I ask you a general question, then I see this. Okay, okay, maybe you should take the question from the audience, which is somewhat technical. I'll let you read it from Kelsey. You see the question? No. In the QA, how did the use of zootropes Fenakis stoscope. Uh, I, I don't know these devices come about for you. That's been an old technology I've been thinking a lot about lately. If you click in the QA, you should see the question. My my literacy in Zoom. That's okay. How did they use zootropes Fenakis? Fenakistoscope. How was uh, how did that come about for you? Using a zoetrope. What the the question is how how did I come across the or how did I come up with the idea of using a zoetrope? Yeah, I guess. Um, it seems it was the right thing. I started. When I was mocking it up in virtual reality, I had the apertures really large. And then one of um, the installers and I we were working, he suggested shrinking the aperture. And then in virtual reality, I, I shrank the aperture even more, the, those archways. And in virtual reality, uh, I saw that there was this after image that was happening because I had an animation of the, of the user in virtual reality going back and forth, you know, the people behind in those, in those alleyways. And uh, I was like, that's going to be inc incredible if that ends up working out in, you know, in like in the actual installation. And it did, it was like rare and strange, um, but, it, but it did, like you would see this sort of like after image out of the corner of your eye. Um, it's not a real zoetrope, but I liked the relationship between virtual reality and um, again, like extrapolating or like having the, the what, a zoetrope is, which is this like very, very crude animation, you know, uh, technology, and then putting that up against a virtual reality, you know, like crude and sophisticated, right? Because it's using your, it's like basically uh, using question, the same guts. My question is more general. I mean, there's there's a lot of art uh, critics, art uh, theorists who, who talk about uh, immersive, um, what is new about immersive art. Um, it's obviously one of the big things that is happening today in the world of art. Although some people could claim the performance art was almost a form uh, of immersive uh, experience. But um, it's it's nice to get the opinion of people actually doing it, of artists like you. So what, what does immersive, the immersive aspect, what does it do to an artist? Well, I mean, you have relational aesthetics and then you have installation and performance work and all that is related. I mean, I think of there's all different types of virtual reality. I think of the virtual reality that I like to make is, is more of a programmed, like I approach it more like a programmed installation, you know, programmed immersive installation. Um, but I, it's, it's closer to installation um, or like gamified installation, you know, it's like it has game. There's a lot of like a lot of virtual reality work that I like to make has like game logic and is built in 
uh, a game engine. Mm -hmm. And a, a question also about your, your gaming experience. Um, <clears throat> I, I assume uh, when you were playing with video games, uh, you had avatars, you were playing some of these um, video games where you uh, pick up an avatar. So for some people, it's a way to stay anonymous. For some people, it's a way to have a second personality. What, what, what is an avatar for an artist? How, how does that uh, help you as an artist? I think going back to state changes, I mean, Man Mask was, I mean, I, the backstory of that piece is that when I was very young, I couldn't find neutrality as a female. And so if I identified as female in those spaces, there was no way uh, to feel, um, to not be othered, you know? And so that was, you know, there's a way, I mean, I think, yeah, state changes are just, and I think that's like what's interesting about um, when we talk about what the metaverse is, I mean, the proposition is that you stay the same that you would in, in, in virtual space, you know, you just, like the scaffolding comes out. I mean, like your appearance, um, your appearance may, you may be able to like customize your appearance, but apart from that, it's like your identity stays pretty fixed, like who you are in the real world lines up, like the social security uh, number lines up in virtual space as it does in a uh, physical space. Um, and that's to like help and aid of, of being able to like buy things. I mean, not literally virtual, not literally social security uh, numbers, but you know, credit cards and, and all that. So I think it's interesting. Um, I mean, how we approach that and how we approach like state change or identity changes. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I certainly have like for my own work and, and with using avatars, it's been, uh, like helpful and necessary.